and welcome. I'm so excited to see so many familiar faces in this crowd. I'm Kelly Taylor Alcott. I'm a literacy education faculty member in the School of Education and the Associate Dean for Research. Today, though, my job is to introduce our speaker, my friend and colleague, Christian Zenkov. And I had to script a little bit because I know lots of wonderful things about Christian and I was afraid I would go on too long and take too much of his time. And you're not here for me, you're here for him. So let me tell you a little bit about Christian. Christian is a professor of literacy education at George Mason University where he coordinates the secondary education program. Most relevant to our gathering today, he is the co-director of the Through Students Eyes Project which has involved youth from contexts ranging from Ohio to Sierra Leone, from Haiti to Virginia. That work has been supported by nearly $2 million worth of grant money and has been described extensively in peer-reviewed journal articles as well as in a book that I wrote in my notes, show it, and then left it in my bag over there. So I'll have to grab it and show it to you in a minute. Um, co-authored with his longtime teacher collaborator, James Harmon. In addition to, to oh, look at that. And you know Thank what, you. This, this is a beautiful co-teaching save because Marissa Ponchev and Ben Dodger and I are teaching a class where we're using content from this book and she just saved me like she also did at eight this morning in our undergraduate class. So yes, here is that book. You're welcome to take a look at my copy after the talk. All right. Now, in addition to today's talk, Christian and his wife, Dr. Audra Parker, wave over there, Audra, <laughs> who's a faculty member in elementary education at Mason and teacher education, they will consult tomorrow with members of a school-university partnership between SU School of Education and the Salve Union Free School District. Wave if you're a bear cat. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. This partnership dates back to 2013 and will include photo voice work this spring as part of an under after school program staffed by SU undergraduates. Wave if you're one of those undergraduates. Yeah. <laughs> that Christian will move easily from this talk to that consultation to a mentoring lunch with students tomorrow is a testament to his status as a boundary crossing scholar which is an idea he speaks and writes about with great passion. Many of my recent interactions with Christian have revolved around partnership literacies, the department he heads for the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy, which I co-edit with my colleague Kathy Hitchman, who's here somewhere too. Wave Kathy Hitchman. There we go. As department editor, Christian has recruited colleagues to write a dozen 2,500 word columns over the past two years, which is no small feat right there. Many of those colleagues focus on the ways his photo voice work has spread and been adapted in varied contexts. Kathy and I often laugh about the layout challenges the manuscripts present to our production department because the list of co-authors is often so long, <laughs> including multiple teachers, faculty members, building coaches, pre-service teacher candidates, and even youth themselves. That the teams are large and varied is a direct result of Christian's unique ability to draw people together around a common vision of schooling that is equitable, empowering, and engaging. I'm sure you'll feel included in that vision too once you hear him speak. Today's talk is supported by the Laura J. and Al Douglas Meredith Professorship, by the Douglas Ficklin Landscape of Urban Education Lecture Series, and by the Salve SOE Partnership. Join me in welcoming Dr. Zinko. introduction <laughs> um, because of course that made me sound um, wonderful way better than I am but um, so I did I wanted to start off with the only prop I have and that's a, a suit jacket I just wanted to see that I have it um, and I just I wanted to let you know that it looks better way better over here than on me um, that's more just a comfort I don't know that I want to add anything to what Kelly shared I think I'd rather just 
tell you and show you um, about this work. And I will say, if nothing else, this uh, putting together this presentation was uh, a really a, a gift for me because it allowed me to um, to step back and to, to really think about something that I've been doing officially for 14 years, um, but unofficially and a lot longer than that. And to really not conceptualize, because we've been conceptualizing all along, uh, but really just to, to make sense of it. And I, I actually think, I was telling Audra, my wife, that um, I'm fascinated by it, which I'm not sure that if that's a good thing or a bad thing, that I'm as fascinated by my own work <laughs> when, when the goal is for you to be fascinated by it. Um, so let's, let's imagine that that's where we'll be by the end of this. So I'm starting with a, I'd like to start with a bit of context, the, the backdrop for this work, and I, I have to begin with a, an image taken by a, a young person, because that, in all, almost every uh, instance of my work, that's what I do, and that's what I ask young people to do, is take photographs and consider them. Uh, this was uh, taken in, in Cleveland, Ohio in, in 2004, um, and it was there that I really started to understand just how images taken by young people could help them to make sense of, 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 of their lives in school. Um, and uh, it was there also that I realized that I, we devised this process, we thought, uh, it, this photo voice process, and, and I'll tell you all about it. Of course, it wasn't something that we devised. It was something that had been exist in existence for about 10 years, but we came, came to this in a really authentic way. We've now done versions of this project through students' eyes uh, with over 1,200 young people, which, when I, I think about that, that sounds like a lot. Um, and it, uh, like I said, it, uh, uh, we started doing it in the, in the 20th century, um, which I, I thought about saying that because it gives it even greater eminence, right? <laughs> Wow, we've been doing this a long time, 14, 14 years or so. Um, and it, it actually started before that. Um, what we'd like to think now is that it's become a differently relevant endeavor to a whole host of, of folks who I'll, I'm going to show you. It started with young people. It moved to pre-service teachers and, and veteran teachers. And now it's relevant to me and to other boundary-spanning uh, teacher educators, school-based and university-based. And that's, that's what uh, the last project I'll share with you. That to me is, it, it may be the ultimate power of this. We started this project absolutely out of desperation. Um, I had moved um, to, to Cleveland in, uh, in 2000 to, um, to start my first job as a faculty member. And what I became aware of um, was uh, something that still it pains me to this day. It, um, the the un, unmet, untapped potential of young people um, in city high schools. And if I told you some of the statistics, I think you'd be as shocked as I still am. But it was clear, because even then I was working across schools and universities, that uh, there was um, more potential that was, being, that was unmet in those young people than anywhere I'd previously been. That crisis of um, of unmet potential, um, it, 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 the easiest way to uh, demonstrate it was that at, when I moved to Cleveland, the dropout rate was 67%, which, um, again, still strikes me as just uh, something uh, virtually, I mean, it, it's, it's criminal, it's really what it is. These young people, though, um, have been informing us, um, and I'd like to think they still do. Um, so uh, this is a picture taken by Sam, and if that's all right, I'm, I'm going to read these to you. There are possibilities. This young man is an artist in the community. He's living proof that not everything is bad in our society. He is an inspiration, not only to me, but to the younger kids. He shows us that there are possibilities out there. So Sam took this image, another one from our first project, um, and she clearly recognized this young man's potential. Um, of course, potential is something almost impossible to, to measure, and I, I'm still conscious of that with the pre-service teachers I work with and the, the young people I work with. But this project was, was uh, an attempt at us attempting to, um, to uh, bridge that gap between 
young people's potential and what we're actually seeing play out, um, particularly in, with things that our society sanctions and particularly with school. That's what we were after. What we did um, was <laughs> we, we turned that question of the purpose of school, um, which these young people question, we turned it directly back on them. And it's something we still do, and I'll, I'll give you an illustration of it. What we thought, and when I say we, uh, Jim Harmon, um, a teacher, colleague that have worked together forever, with forever, um, we thought maybe in a, a, asking some of these questions directly of young people that we might um, actually have answers, um, find answers to those questions. What we also thought was that um, their answers, uh, kids' answers would, might carry more political weight than my answers would, or Jim's answers would. I, uh, I don't usually share this, but um, I, I thought I'd, I'd indulge myself and share a little bit more about where this all comes from for me. Um, this is a picture of my 82-year-old father and my 8-year-old niece. And, um, I share this because it's evidence for me of uh, where all of this concern about potential comes from. And I like to think I come by it honestly. My dad is, uh, uh, I'll say this, and I'm not, I'm not looking for uh, sympathy or anything other than just to give you a sense of uh, where I'm coming from. He's 82. He's on his third form of cancer. Um, um, he's, and he's not doing well physically. He's still uh, an amazing person. And I, I say that objectively, of course. It has nothing to do with the fact that um, I'm his son. He's my dad. What we know now is that um, he's going to pass too soon with um, arguably, in my experience, the greatest awareness of unmet potential of anyone I've ever encountered. And he's been aware of that since I've known him, since I've been sort of sentient. You know, he's, um, he's just that sharp, and it's been just that painful for my siblings and me and my mom to uh, know him and know that he is conscious of the fact that he's uh, smart and creative and uh, funny as hell, um, but he's never achieved anything close to what he, what he would hope. He's scraped by financially his whole life, and he's going to pass um, knowing that he had the ability to do something much more, much different than, than he um, actually, you know, than he'll see. That absolutely was the first example of, of what motivated me to, to start considering this, this notion of potential. I, I will say, again, um, just that I'm honored to, to be here to finally step back and talk about this notion of um, asking being the answer. It's, it's really what the process that we use. And I hope I'm going to illustrate for you how adolescents are the experts um, and, uh, and, and, and the idea that we have nothing to lose by considering them that. Again, I'm going to turn back to young people's pictures and stories throughout because that's, the, that's the, how and that's what orients us always. For those of you familiar with my work, this picture will look very familiar. And, and I trust me, I'm, I'm not here to recycle things I've been sharing for the last 14 years. Um, they're just still some of the most relevant images. Uh, Zidi took this picture again a dozen or so years ago. He was someone who, uh, at the time, um, was uh, uh, highly intelligent, but he was also working about 50 hours a week at his parents' restaurant. And he also clearly had something of, a, of an early gambling addiction. Um, he, even with that, uh, he was very aware of what his peers needed to be successful in school. Teachers who trust you. This is John Sababe. He breaks with friends of mine as much as a couple of times a week in the summer. I go hang out with them sometimes. My friend Tony Fresh Velez, who goes to Lincoln West, breaks with them. He's very good and he's very into it. He's also in the drama club at Lincoln West. The drama teacher lets him do break dancing and plan all the dancing in the school plays, even in the Christmas put, Carol played. Some teachers may not trust you enough to do that. 
That's what keeps guys like him in school. A decade later, um, Zini is now a young husband and father in Buffalo, happy, we're still in touch. And I, um, I still think that his words and, and the notion of teachers trusting young people um, should inform us more than they do. So uh, as a new faculty member at Cleveland State University in 2000, I, uh, I thought I had landed in, in Nirvana. And you may think, that's crazy talk. <laughs> it's, it's Cleveland. You know, how, how can that be possible? It was and it is a, a hard scrabble place. Um, it, it wasn't, you could say it wasn't uh, succeeding in any sense. Um, it, it, uh, its schools were uh, challenged uh, economically. It was a, a, a place with a great deal of poverty. Um, schools were still dealing with uh, busing from the 1970s. It had never made sense of a lot of racial issues. You, you might even say it was the home of white flight, like that's where it was created. It was a hard place to be, um, and it was exactly where I wanted to be. I say now that I was raised by an activist father, um, a social worker mother, and a reputable lineage of scholars and teacher educators um, who, uh, who taught me to, um, to remain deeply idealistic and to run toward the fire instead of away from it. Um, I'd like to think that that's something I'm still doing. So the fire was uh, in my fourth month in Cleveland. The gym roof at East High School collapsed on a school day in October. And I, again, I don't know how you'll react to that. I still react to it with a just absolute astonishment. How could a building that was 20 years old um, it just have a structure, you know, part of its structure just couldn't collapse. No one was seriously injured. A couple of kids were injured. One staff member was injured. But it was the sort of event that, for me, um, made it clear that, it, well, it, it, it made it clear how bad schools were, the challenges that, that Cleveland was facing. But it also turned me towards this photo voice stuff. Um, and I remember thinking, um, and even saying at a school board meeting that, uh, that children aspire to what they see. And if they see uh, the, the roof of a part of their school uh, just fall to the floor, um, it's hard to imagine um, that they're, you know, they're going to value school um, really at all. At that time, I also I, I talked with a lot of folks in the community. I was living in the city, and um, I, I mean, it's just I, I'm a city boy. What troubled me was um, not so much even that, but the reaction. And a, a lot of the folks I spoke with, uh, teachers in the schools I was working in, colleagues at the university, members of the community in my neighborhood, I learned this phrase: um, "It's just Cleveland." And, and I heard it repeatedly during my time there, and I, I fought it at every, every turn. And the, the implication was that it's just Cleveland. We shouldn't expect much here. Um, and it was definitely a sentiment that, that um, carried over. So that October day is one that, um, that I obviously still look back to. Um, and it's one that taught me, because almost immediately afterwards, we started taking pictures of schools that uh, taught me that visual methods might be the most effective and arguably the most necessary methods for young people for whom um, school doesn't matter much um, to make sense of, of the schools and, and start to appreciate them more. This rec rec uh, recognition led me down what clearly is now the <coughs> biggest rabbit hole of my life. Um, and it's uh, what I have discovered, in, in part through this, preparing for this talk, um, the work I do now is really rooted in a number of traditions. Um, these include, and some of these I'm guessing are familiar to some of you, maybe a lot of you, um, visual sociology. That was the first place I went to and realized, oh wait, this is, um, this is tied to what I'm doing. It, visual sociology in a nutshell focuses on the visual dimensions of life with data collected 
using cameras and video recorders, guided by the assumption that communication can and should occur with images and media. This is uh, obviously closely related to multimodal forms of literacy, which again, just consider um, language, gesture, images, uh, various modalities, um, that these are uh, uh, tools that we should be using, um, our young people are familiar with, they are fluent with, um, fluent in, um, and that we, we should be appealing to them in school. It, it's still, it's, not, it's an old concept, but it's a new concept, and it's one that um, teachers, uh, I know, are still struggling with, but it's one that we have to, have to appeal to. All of this is uh, definitely oriented and, and grounded in um, a student voice and youth as experts orientation, and that's uh, um, it, and pretty obviously uh, it suggests that those who are most often the most disenfranchised in school and political exchanges might have some of the most important insights. And that, again, is, I, I hope that that's not too radical of a, of a concept, that we would just turn to young people, that they can be the experts, um, they have the answers that we might need uh, to some of our greatest challenges. All of these are, uh, really definitely rooted in and operationalized by notions of culturally relevant, responsive, and sustaining pedagogies. Um, I, mean, that's, we're, I feel fortunate that uh, those are concepts that, that are continuing to, to evolve, but it definitely is grounding our, my work. They're also tied to uh, notions of partnership literacies, and I thank Kathy and Kelly for letting me explore that with colleagues around the country. And that's the, I, I mean, one of many ideas is that um, literacies, traditional ones like reading, writing, speaking, listening, as well as other literacies like civic ones, um, are best developed through partnerships of school and university and community constituents. This plays out in two ways. Um, one is just that notion of youth participatory action research. And I, I appreciate again that YPAR is something that um, I and probably a lot of us have been doing and didn't know what it was called. Photo Voice was like that and YPAR is like that as well. Um, and again, it's just that notion that young people um, can and should be considered scholars. And that is, you know, that's kind of where we've gotten to with this. It's where we started and it's where we've gotten to. How this plays out, and this is the part that I'm most excited about these days, is this notion of critical project-based clinical experiences. And that sounds like a mouthful. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll define it for you. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, again, it's, it, it's where we've evolved to, it's where um, our pedagogies have landed, and I'll, I'll tell you about that. So let me just tell you um, pretty briefly about some of the elements of this work. And I think um, when Kelly asked me to give this talk, I thought, okay, I, I should definitely lay out just this process um, because it's something that I, I know can be used in virtually any context because I, I was counting today. We've implemented this in over 30 different settings and I, I, a, a list that is way more diverse than I ever would have imagined that it would have, would have gotten to. There are some core elements to this. So we start with now a recruitment of a teacher, a teacher who now um, often one of our graduates, graduate program, the licensure program, or a doctoral student, they come to me and they say, most often they say, hey Zenka, will you come do your thing with my students? <laughs> <laughs> That's, okay, a absolutely, but I know what that means. Um, what it means is they've experienced some of the power of some of these through photo voice and, and the through student structures, and they want me to do that with their students. They don't want me to, they want, to, they, they want that, those tools with their students. Um, they, of course, it, uh, it begins with, then it moves to selection of a group of students. Um, one of the things we've figured out with this process is that we can't do this with 100 people or 1,000 a, a people. It has to happen with a small group. As a researcher and a teacher and a teacher educator, that's mildly problematic because we're always looking for that notion of generalizability and we're always looking for impact. Um, and at some point, one or 26 of you are going to ask me about research on the um, the impacts of, you know, the evidence of that, that this stuff works. And we're going to need a longer conversation than we have time for. Um, it then, we then have to identify a curricular focus. And this is just an, an obvious thing, that 
if we're going to work in a, with a class of kids, and we do this almost exclusively in schools now, it has to have relevance to what they're teaching. It can't just be um, me coming in and, and you know, uh, creating something from whole cloth and, and performing. Um, it's got to be something that's connected to what they're doing anyway. And that's just a reality for teachers. Um, but it also speaks to, to, for me, to my ethic in this work, that I don't want to be um, the sage on the stage. I don't want to be, um, you know, I, I don't want to perform for anyone. I want us to engage with young people and now pre-service teachers and veteran teachers. Um, this is the most exciting part to me now. We now um, run two or three projects a semester um, that are completely implemented by pre-service teachers. And I tell the, the pre-service teachers that I work with is that one of the reasons why I like doing this and that why I love the, how this project has evolved to, you know, to include them is that it, um, I get paid to do less and less um, <laughs> because I, I turn it over to them. And really what's happening is I show them the structure and model the process for them and then I say, and tomorrow you're going to be working with a group of young people, and you're going to have to do this. Um, so far, no one's shot me down and said, no, Zenko, I, I won't do that. We do do it in a short-term way, and that's a, another key piece of this. It's novel enough, and it's actually um, not just novel, it's sort of unsettling to young people, a lot of the structures that we use. One, asking them to answer questions with pictures. That's not something that if you said to a 16-year-old, um, in DC, hey, we're going to answer questions with pictures. They don't say, okay, that makes all the sense in the world to me. I'm excited to do that. Um, so we do it in short bursts, um, really tightly planned so that, uh, again, so it doesn't interrupt anyone's day, um, is integrated with curricula, but so that, um, uh, that, that we just you know, don't, don't overtake um, a teacher's schedule. Again, it is um, just a, a short-term intervention so that we are honoring everyone's time and really allowing young people to, to do this in, in a, an intensive way, but again, in a short-term way. So we always begin, and I tell my students this, we always begin with a very uncomfortable get-to-know-you community building activity. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do anything like that now. Um, but we, we always do this. It's, it's definitely a way to get to know kids and put them somewhat at ease. Um, it's a way to get to uh, the pre-service teachers who are working with me, typically at, you know, 5 to 15, um, for them to start interacting with kids because they're, I mean, they're pretty new at this. But it gets them going and gives them, um, gives them license to be somewhat silly. Um, but it also just gives them license to interact with young people and, and ask them questions. But what we do, almost right away after a, a get to know you activity is we start to um, ask the questions that are going to be the focus of that particular project. And I'm going to give you six different examples of those questions in a, in a bit. So we ask questions, and this, I would ask for just a little bit of help with this. So let's imagine that this is a community building activity that we, we're doing with 20 uh, adolescents, like juniors in high school. We did this activity, and then we ask, what does this a community building activity have to do with great teaching? one of the questions that we ask now. Let me just ask someone, what would you say? Or what, would, what do you think a young person would say? What does a community building activity have to do with great teaching? Anyone? <laughs> Everyone, please. Most students would normally say having the opportunity to work together and learn from each other would really help them along in any type of support that they do. Nice. nice. I don't know if you could hear that, but um, having the opportunity to work together, uh, to, to get along, you know, just helps them to, you know, to be better in, in school. Let me ask a different question. What, what would such community building activity have to do with being a good citizen? And that's, again, something that we've asked young people at, at a, um, a juvenile detention center, a couple of different projects. What does such an activity have to do with being a good citizen? So you might be surprised at this. I actually hope you are. Um, the young people that we work with always have answers for these questions. We're posing big questions to them, um, abstract, obtuse, important <coughs> questions. In this day and age, being a citizen, that's an important question to ask. 
They always have answers after that, after an opening activity. One more. What is what do community building activities have to do with challenging racism? That's again another series of questions we've asked young people at, at, a, um, at a Virginia High School recently. Crickets. Crickets. Anyone? You get to know people as people. Say it one more time, please. You get to know people as people, not labels or okay. categories. Okay, you get to know people as people. Again, they always have answers, and this just starts to warm them up. What we then do is, um, I, I say, we pull the rug out. So we've done an activity, we ask them some of these questions, always the questions that we're going to focus on, and then I show them images from previous projects. And I do that, and I think pretty obviously, so that they recognize that, oh wait, other young people have done this, this strange process that you have already you know, started with us. It, yes, this makes some sense. Other people have done it. Our peers have done it. They appreciate that. But we also do it um, uh, just to get them to, to start to think about you know, some of the questions that we want to ask them. So this is a, a photograph that one of my students took last semester, um, a project about, well, you know, I'm not going to tell you. Um, let me just pose this to you. How does this picture answer any or all of the following questions? So this gets harder because we're asking them how to turn towards images. And you, you might have to speculate what this is. I'll tell you what it is in a second. What is justice? And if this is hurting your brain, that's a good thing. Help. Go. Um, well, when I first looked at it, I think of like the cross and religion, and a lot of people tend to, I guess, think of their morals and any like guiding principles from their personal beliefs. I guess they consider that justice. Okay. Okay. So it's re religion. It looks like a cross. It's religion. Consider their morals, their, their beliefs. This is our latest question, and it's the one I'm going to end with because it's the one I'm most excited about. It uh, might be the, I, I would argue now, might, it might end up being the most important project we do. How does this picture answer the question, how can you have conversations with someone with whom you don't agree? I haven't asked that of young people yet, but we're going to ask it starting next week. And I have awesome wait time, so <laughs> go, please. Uh, be comfortable with what you believe in. OK. How does this answer the question, what does your community need? Faith. And your, our community, you mind saying a little more? Our community needs? Faith. He's not going to say anymore, is he? <laughs> awesome. I'll leave it at that. So here's what um, this student uh, wrote. And I, I, I did, I, I'm not giving you your full name just because I, um, uh, just for uh, permission's sake and her own protection. This is a picture of my religion, Ethiopian, Ethiopian Orthodox. Our community is surrounded with others that have no actual path in life. Our community needs religion, any kind of religion. It's our beliefs that are going to keep us from making decisions that we will regret one day. It is our beliefs that are going to lead us to a good life we always imagined for ourselves. It is our beliefs that are going to teach us the good and the bad and help us make decisions based on that. So I believe that religion, any sort, is going to help us to be better people. In this day and age, in my opinion, um, that's a pretty thoughtful response and a pretty important one. It's also um, in response to a, what does our community need? That's that last question. So the project procedures, and I'll run you through these pretty quickly. We start with um, that uh, community building activity I mentioned. Um, we turn um, almost right away to a series of questionnaires. And we have, because we've done this at least 30 different times with probably 15 different emphases, um, we've got a, you know, every, one of the, every time we have a different set of uh, project questionnaires. We start by handing those to, to students and ask them to start to fill them out, keep some, you know, jot some notes, bullet points, etc. But we almost immediately turn towards interviews, and this is where 
young people have some initial answers, and then the preceptor teachers I work with serve as mentors, typically one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes small groups with, with one preceptor teacher, and they interview these young people about some of these questions. And we've discovered that that bit of scaffolding seems to work well. I'm sure it's not the only process that you could use, but that community building piece, followed by um, a little bit of reflection, followed by some images of, of um, young people's uh, you know, reflecting on other projects, young people's uh, photographs, questionnaires, interviews, I mean, it, it gets us into the, the process pretty well. So here's just an example of, of a questionnaire. And you can see that this one is um, focusing on our most popular, <coughs> reflecting on school's purposes, supports, and impediments. So we ask questions like, what do you as a student believe are the purposes of school? What do you believe will happen as a result of doing well in school? Um, we then turn to that presentation, and I will say, these steps do shift somewhat. Um, and then we turn to this whole photo walk process, which is uh, one of the heart, hearts and souls of, of the process. Um, it's uh, more straightforward than you might think, but we do it in turn, in, as exercises. We ask young people to, uh, with mentors, with my pre-service folks, to go and take pictures um, in response to the project questions or just to take pictures. And that's one of the ethics of, of this project is you have to just shoot. You can't delete any pictures. You just, just have to shoot and shoot and shoot. Multiple angles, two or three shots per subject, um, but shoot. We plan out the, the photo walks that they'll do. We then, over time, if we have enough sessions, we, uh, we make them go into other places. So places like um, this week we did it in school, next week do it in your neighborhood. The following week, do it in a place where someone in your family works. The following week, do it uh, uh, in a place where you worship. Um, you can think that it's an endless series. And the point is never to take pictures of things in that particular place. It's to get them to keep thinking that, wait, they might find images that illustrate answers and help them to, to um, explore their thinking through, through images, through a greater variety of images. And again, that's just the photo walks. So just a couple of examples of the planning sheets. We ask them to do this ahead of time. So it's simple things like one picture I want, I want to take would show the purpose of school, why I come to school, things and people that support my success. So this is something, again, that young people can do on their own, but it's really something that's better done, supported by a pre-service teacher. And then we use a photo log, photo walk log. And we don't don't always use this, but it's a, it's a good way to just help them focus and keep track of the images that they're taking. We don't do this with every image because it would just be exhausting. The next step, and this is this is the good stuff, and this is where um, where I start to think about um, pedagogy. The elicitation conferences, typically one on one, a young person and a pre service teacher sitting down, just uh, talking through images and. It's actually one of the most exciting uh, steps of this in, in, in the years of doing this. If I'm going to sit with, um, uh, uh, with Kelly and just ask her questions, um, a young person, in my experience, too often is going to uh, feel put on, on the spot. They're not going to be as willing or, or able to answer questions honestly. Um, they're going to be uncomfortable, shy, whatever. They're new to me, they're new to them. But if we hold up a photograph and we're both looking at that, it diffuses something, it redirects, it takes the pressure off, and, um, and they're much better able to answer questions, to think through things. It helps when we have a whole host of elicitation questions. Um, and we give them to the young people, um, lay it in front of them, ask them, hey, look at this, which question would you like to answer? Oh, and we give them to the preceptor teachers who are facilitating this, and they pick questions and answer them as well, and help you know, and pose them to the young people. This it, it's such a simple process. I don't want to you know minimize it. It's um, it, uh, it, it, but it's just so effective. I mean, it just it gives them a way to to talk through and think through uh, what they're doing. The last part is. Um, <coughs> After they've taken photographs and written some, and, and actually most of the writing, the initial writing in particular, is transcription. It's an adult, a pre teacher, asking a young person about their thinking. That in itself is another powerful, powerful process. 
Um, most of the young people we work with are disenfranchised, very often in alternative public, often juvenile detention center set, uh, settings. Um, they're not used to adults listening to them and writing down their words. That is absolutely a foreign activity, and it's a super powerful one. So you might say, others might say from a writing instruction standpoint, well, no, they need to write. Uh, they need to compose. They don't need to write. So we choose photographs, um, kind of funnel down from the pool of photographs that they took, and they do some writing revisions with our help. And finally, it always ends with an exhibition. And that's just <coughs> to honor their work and always asking them what, um, is, who's an audience that you'd like to share this with? So just an example and kind of give you a sense of the diversity of where we've done this. Um, I was fortunate to live in Haiti for a year, a year post um, the earthquake. And to do this project a couple of, well, three or four different times, um, uh, asking questions again like, what does your community need? What kind of a leadership role would you play? And Asafi took this image. So we had an exhibition at, uh, it's called Hokal, the Foundation for Knowledge and Liberty um, in Port-au-Prince. And for, unfortunately, I wasn't able to be there, but I was able to send the images and fund the event and you know, uh, just get lots of documentation. So this is what she shared. Looking for life. This young, young woman is named Jennifer. She's about 18 years old. She lives in the neighborhood of Delmont 4 with her mother and some of her sisters. Now this young girl is in her third year of high school and she attends a school called Collège Varina de l'Homme de Salut. Forgive me for mangling that, but I try. She looks for work to do in the morning, work that won't give her too many problems so that she can also study. Now she sells water from 8 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. and runs, runs to school to be there from 12 noon to 5.30 p.m. Even though she's always tired, she goes back to selling water at 6 p.m. when she gets off school until 9 p.m. When she goes home and goes to sleep so she can wake up early so she'll have a little time to study. She cinched her belt tight and steeled herself to stand tall in the face of life. Because if you don't just stay staring at this life, it'll never say anything to you. You must confront it. Confront it so you can overcome it and the difficulties it brings. I'm still struck by that, that this um, Asafi was 19 at the time, that this is what she would compose based on um, an image after conversations, but um, something um, super insightful. So the project has evolved, and this is, in my mind, this is the good, good stuff. There's been good stuff, but this is the good, good stuff. From originally a, one that, a project that fo focused on advocacy, and it's like the Cleveland schools, we needed to advocate for um, something different to happen in, in the city, if, you know, what was happening in the schools. So a uh, project that focuses on curriculum, and I'll give you a couple examples. And what I think is most important to a project that focuses on some different notions of pedagogy. So the first project, and this is just historical, was uh, what uh, started us off. It's through students' eyes. And the question, the big question was, what do U.S. urban adolescents believe about school? Questions were these. What's the purpose of school? What helps you to attend and be successful in school? What impedes your attendance and success in school? Again, Jim, teacher colleague, and I asked these questions because we didn't have the answers. And our policymakers and school board members and other teachers didn't have the answers. And we just thought, we, we need answers. And we really thought, if we ask these questions of young people, maybe they'll engage more in school and actually come up with answers that um, that, uh, you know, that, that we can use. So, so this is um, just an example. Again, it's one from um, a long time ago now, but it still still resonates. Um, this was taken by uh, Kayla, and it's a picture of her dad. Um, Kayla was uh, a junior in high school when I met her, and an absolute spitfire of, it, of a young person. Um, I, I still say that she knew more about navigating life then than I did as, a, as an adult. Like she just um, she, she, uh, had it going in a way that no one would expect. And she was also incredibly demanding. Um, she was as tough on a teacher and teachers as, I've, as anyone as I've, I've ever known. But um, I love that because, hey, don't you want your kids to demand more of you, especially in the school system that's not demanding much of anyone? So this is her thought. What K, what you want. 
My father is a hardworking and respectful person. I can always talk to him about things that occur in school in general. He's always telling us about how he wishes he would have graduated from high school. My dad quit school a year and a half before he would, would have graduated because of his experience in the Cleveland School District. Before that, he attended schools in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania, and that showed him what it's like to be in a better and more organized school district. So it's very hard for him in Cleveland. When he finally made friends, busing took them away from him. Both of his parents were taken by the time he was 12. So was, when his friends were taken too, he had no one to turn to. That's why he dropped out. My dad is a strong person, but he's also tired and withered. I don't want the same thing to happen to me. In 2013, we expanded the project to Iraq. And we've been able to do this in Iraq, Sierra Leone, India, and Haiti. Um, with a focus uh, uh, called Picturing Change. We partnered with uh, the Education for Peace in Iraq Center in DC and Center for Global Studies um, at Mason and um, the um, American, American University, yeah, American University of Iraq and Suleimani. We ask these questions. Right now in your country, what do you see as the most important issue affecting your, the people you care about? What positive change do you hope to want to see happen within your lifetime? And how do you see yourself being a part of that positive change? Um, young people in, the, in this project and other versions uh, take images and sometimes borrow them. And as I asked Eric, my uh, partner in this project, um, wait, where, where, how did I get this picture? And he said, oh, it was on my phone. So he thought this was, Howard thought this was really illustrative of, of um, what he shared here. My ancestors were poor and did not have much, yet they were able to plant gardens, farm the land, raise livestock, and carve out self-sufficient livelihoods by sheer will and determination. Hard work and self-sufficiency. Those are important lessons from our past, <coughs> values that can guide me toward a better future. People should not be shamed when they are not doing anything wrong, especially when they are trying to do something that is important for the better of their community or for society as a whole. Rather than live in the past, we should learn from the past and work hard together to move forward to advance ourselves and our nation. So those are two examples of the advocacy work that we've done. Um, I'd like to share just two examples of uh, the curricular work. So one of the first ones was um, working with a group of seventh and eighth graders, English language learners at a middle, a middle school. Um, the teacher I was working with, Megan, uh, had had her students just read uh, as he uh, Hinton's The Outsiders. And we thought, what, what do we do with that? And so we talked it through with, with Megan and then um, her students and the pre-service teachers who were starting to work with us. With just 14 of them um, in the middle school right near, um, just in Northern Virginia, with these questions. Where do you feel like an insider or outsider at school? Where do you feel like an insider or outsider in your neighborhood? Where do you feel like an insider or outsider where powerful people work? What can teachers do to help you feel like an insider in school in the classes? You can probably guess that we ask the students to take fo do photo walks at school in their neighborhoods, and then we ask them, where do powerful people work? So we took a trip to DC because that's where powerful people work, and they, didn't, and they had to do a, a photo walk there. And I've blurred out the photograph a bit so you, it's not identifiable, but this is um, what this uh, young man wrote. This one is the most important picture. This is my sister, and she's a year and a half old. She doesn't say my name yet, but she can say Zafakro. She has the power to walk, the power to talk some words, and to eat by herself. She is learning both Spanish and English. She won't be an outsider by not speaking English like me. When we're little, we can't walk, but we're learning every day. She's an important person in my life. She's little, and I need to take care of her. I have power because I am protecting her. I'm a good brother. My mom also has the power to protect, and my father. When she grows up, I want her to have the power to play soccer and beat me. I want her to learn lots of languages so she can talk to everyone and earn a lot of money for speaking lots of languages. <laughs> and this, I mean, it's, it, it's lovely, it's thoughtful, it's, I mean, and it's accurate. Particularly in Northern Virginia, you learn a lot, you can speak a lot of languages, you can make a lot of money. So the other place where we've gone with this is my curriculum. Um, so high school, middle school curriculum, but also teacher education curriculum. And uh, arguably the best example is now this uh, writing relationships, uh, Pacha Pacha, um, where we, I do this every semester now with, with my pre-service folks. They have to explore their own and a young person's 
uh, perspectives on writing with these questions. How did you learn to write? And who would want to influence your relationship to writing in and out of school? What do you believe are the, pur believe are the purposes of writing in and out of school? And what supported your ability to write and your interest in writing in and out of school? What impeded your, what impeded your ability to write and your interest in writing in and out of school? So we, we asked the pre-service teacher to answer those questions with photo voice, with the pachak cha. Um, 20, 20 slides, 20 seconds, they turn it into a, a nine movie. And then they have to do the same thing with the young person, interview them again, and then they have to merge their projects, and then they have to talk to us about and, and uh, illustrate intersections and tensions. What did you learn about writing instruction as a, as a result of talking with this young person? I'm gonna skip the audio portion of this, but um, it's a gorgeous example of the project where, that Carson, um, she did this just last semester, you know, she used uh, Polaroids to, with a young person herself to illustrate all of this um, and, and just uh, had a, a, you know, a powerful set of reflections on what all this meant for her future teaching. So the last place we've gone with this is pedagogy. Um, we've recognized that our uh, photo voice work is really um, about pedagogy more than anything else. It's about those interactions that are core to, to, um, to getting this work done, but more so um, what we uh, just would lie, I guess I'd argue for now is that some of the foundation structures, the elicitation conferences, the one on word and work, et cetera, should be, I'd say have to be foundational in, uh, particularly in writing and instruction, but I, I would argue just in school in general. So let me give you um, just a, couple uh, elements of this. So this critical project-based clinical experiences, um, they're conducted now, and this is the, it's the most important thing for me as a university-based teacher educator, but as a boundary spanner as well. Explicit relevant for youth, for pre-service and in-service teachers, and for university and school-based teachers. Um, I'm, I'm hoping it will be clear how, that, how these matter to all of those constituents, but Again, still implemented with diverse, often disenfranchised young people. Um, we do this in our methods courses. I do it in every methods course I teach now, and, and actually pull from other methods courses. It involves co-teaching, co-learning, and co-researching for teacher candidates, but really for everyone involved. And they absolutely are collaboratively conducted research projects. That's how we frame this, is that we are all operating as researchers the young people, the pre-service teachers, the veteran teachers, and, and me. Um, and it is, you see the results, it's a beautiful, um, authentic integration of literary, literacy, writing instruction, and life skills. And again, we do this in um, short bursts, weekly sessions for typically three to four, sometimes five weeks. So um, just one example, before I give you the good, good, good stuff, is this project, um, Perspectives on Exceptional Teaching. It's actually an elective course that I teach, where we literally, I, I work with now, I do it every summer, 23 service teachers, 60 mil in high school use, and veteran teachers in those classrooms, and then me and typically a colleague. The questions, what do you believe makes an exceptional teacher? What's the evidence that an exceptional teacher is successful at his or her job from a teacher's perspective? What's the evidence from a student's perspective? And what's the evidence from the public's perspectives? Again, our pre-service teachers answer these questions with photos. <coughs> then they um, work with young people one-on-one -on -one in schools to answer these questions. Then they combine them and look for intersections and tensions. And then they actually ask these questions of veteran teachers in these schools. <coughs> Just an example from one of the first versions of this. And this is uh, Caroline. Um, in her, well, her final project, used this image to illustrate the idea that um, it's one of the young people she talked with uh, explained that um, sometimes some of the feedback that he gets from teachers doesn't feel good, doesn't feel good in his ears. Um, it's, I mean, those are the sorts of insights that uh, these pre-service teachers are getting from young people. And this is the last one. Arguably the best one. So I'll, this is this, there's a lot of text there. So let me just tell you what it is. Um, we're 
I was, I was talking with Laurel Taylor, the teacher that I work with at T.C. Williams High School, which, by the way, T.C. Williams, if you don't know, is uh, of Remember the Titans fame. Um, it's a cool place to be. It's the only high school in Alexandria, Virginia, which means that everyone goes there. Um, and when I say everyone, I mean everyone. It is the United Nations of high schools, and it's a, it's a gift to be there. But I was talking with her, um, Laurel, and we've been partnered together for five years, just a couple weeks ago. No, actually, it was in November. It was just after, it was a year from the election, um, presidential election. And we were talking about the fact that her students were saying to her that um, they feel so much tension in their community. They are wary of um, venturing outside of their community now. And this is, these are, again, United Nations of kids. They're afraid. Um, they're afraid to talk to anyone outside of their community. And Laurel and I just thought, okay, what do we do with this? We have to take this on directly. So we're asking them three questions. What is it like to be you? What is your life like? And what is it like to be known? I've now got about eight, I think, pre-service teachers and doctoral students who are going to come with me to start next week. The, we're going to ask the young people to um, answer those questions with photo voice. And then we're going to ask them to identify someone who they disagree with about something foundational. We're going to ask them to find someone that they would have a difficult conversation with. And we're going to work with them, with that person, to answer those same questions with photo voice. What we're hoping is um, to uh, generate one more um, set of uh, images, ideas, conversations that really do get at some of the, the most important things that I think you know, we can consider these days. Um, I was reminded um, of, as I was thinking about this talk, of um, the recent events, so it feels recent to me, in Charlottesville. Um, my wife actually uh, went to the University of Virginia, and um, as Oral and I were talking about um, this work, but, and we talked about this, that really these are the sorts of things that have been, feel like they've been normalized now. Um, and these are the sorts of things that we think we have to, to take on with young people. Um, it was uh, November 9th, 2016, that I was working with um, uh, Kenmore Middle School the day after the election in another group, a class with a group of English language learners. And um, this feels visceral to me and horrifying. That day with those young people felt the same. Um, the day after the election, um, I, I have never seen children as terrified um, uh, in a building, in a school building, as I did that day. Um, crying and worried about, or legitimately worried about what was going to happen to them and their family members. I argue now that it's some of the pedagogies that we enact through photo voices and this photo elicit elicitation work and primarily now where we're involving young people in authentic questions that they have, this having difficult conversations um, came from our kids. Involving pre-service teachers in those interactions, those one-on-one -on -one work, we talk about having difficult conversations, um, talk, learning to talk to a high school student, a pre-service teacher learning how to do that, that's a difficult conversation, but it's one they have to, they have to learn how to have. Um, I, I would argue now that it's those pedagogies, it's not the curriculum, it's not a, the notions of advocacy, <coughs> it's those sorts of interactions that should be foundational, um, not just in my work, but in all teachers' work. Um, I venture that these sorts of projects allow young people to own adult-like tasks of questioning the social contract, um, of schooling and, and society. Um, I guess I'd like to argue now that these methods, 
and projects, methods, pedagogies are ones through which our diverse youth may be best able to show us what they already know and what they'd like to, to see in schools and beyond. That's it. <laughs> before anyone asks any questions is uh, um, I think my wife would attest that I'm usually way funnier than I was. <laughs> so we do have the room for a little bit and we can take some questions. I'll be your MC and bring you a mic so people can hear it. I know though that some of you do have to go because you have a class that's going to continue or that's going, you have to get somewhere else for a class. So don't feel self-conscious about moving. But if you have a question and you can stay, we'll, we'll do that for just a, a few minutes right here. Anybody want to start us off? Oh, Keith, no, I'm bringing you the mic. Oh, no, you don't. Go. How do you come up with the guiding questions? All right, let me just repeat that for the, for the cart, Keith. How do you come up with the guiding questions? Uh, Keith, faith. <laughs> That, uh, now it's um, it, we keep them to a limited list, and now um, with this last set, I think we've I'd like to think we haven't perfected it because I don't, I don't really believe in that. But these came from the young people, and literally from them, and it's just we just learned that hey, we can actually ask them. Okay, what's the issue? So we got to like with this having a different conversation, we got to the topic, and then we said, well, what, you know, what would you like to say? Um, what would you like to ask? And what we realized, because the, the students with this having a uh, conversations project, they're reading August Wilson's play Fences. Um, and they, the theme that came out was that Troy and Rose and other characters in the play really are screaming at the world, pay attention to me, I, I, I matter. Um, and that's what, that when talking with young people about that play, they said, that's what it feels like right now, is that, I mean, literally, two weeks ago, that, that's what it feels like, that everyone is saying, I matter, um, and, and, and no one's listening to each other, so somehow we need to talk across. So always, it wasn't always the way, but now we turn it on then. It's okay, I won't leave one either. Oh, I think, I think it helps with the transcription, so I'll just uh, run to you quickly. <laughs> Christian, there are bigger questions in the room, I'm sure, but I have a nuts and bolts one. How do you equip your students to take the photographs? And who and how are the, by whom and how are the images managed afterwards? Because you must be producing thousands. Yeah, yeah, actually, um, I could say faith again, couldn't I? Um, so it, it's evolved. It started with disposable cameras, which and even then, now it sounds stupid. Like, really? They were digital cameras at the time. Then we eventually purchased digital cameras, and now it is 100% this. Um, and uh, the photo quality is so good um, that you know, it's a right, reasonable thing. And now we, um, and that's the biggest challenge, is to get young people to not, not take pictures. Like t they take tons of pictures but to share them with us so that we have access to them. And now it's just you know, uh, cloud sharing sorts of things. And it's become less and less uh, of, of an issue. Um, but it is, from a management standpoint, um, I stopped counting the images that we have in the various files. Um, but that is, logistically, that's the biggest challenge. But um, the handy dandy smartphone, that's been a, a, a you know, godsend for us. So are you providing those for the kids? No. No, they actually bring their own, yep, and, and a simple, you know, uploading to a shared folder, and, and it's become pretty, you know, pretty simple, um, much easier than it used to be with digital <coughs> photographs and so on. Well, thank you for the good presentation. Uh, my question is about um, the projects that you have in Iraq. I'm um, curious, how do you coordinate that? Do you have people on the ground and you have to go there for you to support the facilitation and the picture taking and how, or how do they get to you? Thank you. It's, um, it's very, so she, 
it's very um, in Iraq. I had a, a partner. Actually, you'll love this. The partner was actually the director of the Education for Peace in Iraq Center, who was a student teacher who I supervised <laughs> at the University of Wisconsin 20 plus years ago. Um, he ended up dropping out of, uh, of school and was never a teacher, but he started this epic at Education for Peace and Rec Center, and he's been doing that work ever since 20 plus years. For that project, I hoped to go with him and do it. He actually did it, and I, and I was in contact with him and with the young people. It wasn't daily, but it was often. Um, I walked him through the process, and read a lot of the work that we've produced, um, and it, what's funny is the, he was he was doing that in Iraq while I was doing a different version of the project in India. Um, so um, so sometimes I'm there, sometimes I'm not. Um, it's, it does take um, that's the primary piece of this, and it's actually for me the pedagogy piece. It takes intense one-on-one -on -one work, um, um, young person, young people to to adults, caring adults. Um, so it's not just me. I can't do it with you. I, I need. 20 people to do it with you because um, it's that those conversations. May I ask? Yes. <laughs> May I ask, once you have done the project, what happens then? I mean, it's been wonderful. <coughs> Everyone has had this wonderful experience. What happens after the four to ten sessions and the exhibition is over. So, uh, that's a great question. For us now, and this is, it speaks to my role, and it's actually something I think about um, as much as anything these days, and write about as much as anything these days. Um, I'm almost exclusively doing this in our partner schools, schools where I live. Um, we have six partner schools um, in, with our master's licensure program. So there are ones where if I'm not there, then I have colleagues who are there. If I'm not there, I have pre-service teachers who are there. If I'm not there, I've got graduates who are there. Um, so I, uh, I've always been wary of the one and done and wary of, you know, hey, look at me. Let me be smart in a PhD and tell you how to do things. Um, I, I am absolutely a grassroots sort of person. So I, I tend not to, to just go to various places and do this. We do it in places where we're still going to be there, and I'm going to be there, if not next week, then next month or next year, and folks who are working with me are going to be there as well. I also, I mean, I, during your question, like, what do you do with this? Um, and that's the, I mean, that's where we're headed now in this, with this having a difficult conversations piece. We've always shared it, you know, been able to write a lot of things about it. Um, now, we're thinking, and it, I think we're kind of late to the game, but better late than never, sharing it via media that young people are identifying. So we asked, how, would you, how do you want to share this? And they said Instagram, like that's the corner of the realm, or that's how we're going to share it this time. Um, so that's the, I, mean, I think we'll, we'll give it more life, because um, we'll you know, re reach a wider audience. Um, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. Give me a lot to think about. <laughs> I was wondering what you might recommend for uh, pre-service and uh, first-year teachers to engage in a classroom where that conflict between <coughs> students and the establishment is already, um, you know, one where the students expect conflict, where they expect not to be listened to. And, and you could be vague or just, <laughs> you know. I'm not going to use faith one more time. Um, so when you say uh, conflict between kind of their expectations and the reality of school? Yes. Well, where they don't really expect it to, to be of any value to them, or, or they're, they're disengaged intentionally and as much as possible. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would say now, because it's actually something I, I talk with pre-service teachers about, and actually that, one of the real powers of this in my mind is that I'm not just a university-based teacher educator. I'm working with young people. I'm at T.C. Williams High School every Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday, working with this 12th grade class. 
that's one of the best things, and I know Kelly's I know doing this, the same thing, that's one of the best things for pre-service teachers. So I'm not just preaching, I'm doing on a, on a, a weekly basis. Um, and then I'm taking them in for other projects. What I say now is, and it's a persistence thing, it is a faith thing, that um, the power of asking young people some of these questions um, is, if, if you know that they are so disengaged and so, um, not cynical, but I mean, rightfully uh, detached, um, rightfully thinking that maybe this institution doesn't, or isn't really for them, turning that question, those questions on them, um, I don't, I, we never expected a, a silver bullet. Um, you know, they didn't engage immediately and they didn't, um, they didn't have solution, life changing solutions immediately, but asking over and over and over again. Asking them for the solutions. Yeah, yeah, and that's the stance piece and that's the pedagogy piece. And I, I, I don't know how radical that is. Maybe it's not at all, and maybe it is too much, you know, maybe it's insane. But I, I think now, because I see this, I see this with pre teachers who go with me over and over and over again, and, and I don't give them any space to stop. I don't, they, when they struggle with young people and asking these questions, they say to me, oh, you know, this young person, the f folks I worked with today, didn't say much or just gave sort of pat answers or whatever. Um, I, uh, I've learned, I don't say a word. I just say, well, let's go back tomorrow. Um, and they learn that if you are that persistent with something that basic, that eventually you'll find the words or the young person will start to trust you. And again, not magically, but because if you're investing even a little bit over a couple of weeks, they start to believe that you actually give a shit. Um, which is, and that's something, I mean, that's, that's it. If they think that there's someone in that school who actually is a part of that school and actually cares about them, they can start to make the connection between school and them. <laughs> came out in capital letters on the cart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it came out in capital letters on the cart. Oh, nice. <laughs> the cart is smart. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to swear some more. <laughs> How could you see this being used with younger students, elementary age students? That's, thank you for asking that. That's, that's part of the reason we we're here. We need that question tomorrow. Yes. So the youngest I've done this with is fourth graders. And I think that might have been the, um, the time when I realized that um, I couldn't be, you know, super professor, you know, engaging everyone. Um, it, it wouldn't work. We started out of necessity bringing pre-service teachers in, in, in mass um, out of need. Like we needed the numbers. And then we realized, oh wait, well we wanted to share the, the notion within the process. And then we realized, oh wait, this is part of the structure. Um, so I would, I, one, I would turn it back on um, elementary folks, my wife, and you for sure, and I imagine you, um, for what are some of the words that we would use. Because to me, and it's something we talk about with my folks all the time, those elicitation questions are great, but that's the, the little bit of science of it. The art of it is you having, you kind of wrangling, wiggling, weaseling your way into what are the words that are going to resonate with, with kids. Um, I think about different uh, images that you know, would help them, obviously shorter text blocks, um, uh, and I, I, different sorts of scaffolding. I think now, though, um, I think we have to do it with younger kids because, and I, I won't say this like it's the be all end all of anything, but I will say that the process of asking young people to answer questions about real big issues that they articulate are real and big, that is something that we should be doing, if not every day, then very often, and even with younger kids, because you know, then they'll become older kids who are better able to answer those questions. And I venture now, based on the, having the different conversations, if we did all that, um, some of the um, ugly, awful things that we see in our society, our, our, our political reality, it, it might be different. Time for one more.
my question is around language other than English. Have you, well, it seems uh, you've worked with, uh, well, abroad, but I'm just curious to know how, how, how could this apply for, for example, as, as a foreign language, language teacher? Could I replicate this, for, for instance? Um, and if so, what would be, what are some tips you would have? Yeah. So I, I brought with me, Kelly, I brought for tomorrow, I brought a, a kind of a, examples of a number of the, the materials we've used across the 15 years, um, including one where the elicitation questions were I translated into Spanish. Um, and so that's just an obvious one that, hey, you have to have this in, um, in a home language. Um, what I'd say now, because we, we tried this um, at Kenmore in this uh, super diverse classroom, kids from, I, I couldn't tell you how many different countries, all recent arrivals. And we had a group of uh, pre service teachers and doctoral students who were not fluent um, in, I mean, a few in Spanish, but in general, not. not. Um, and it, um, it doesn't work. Um, you have to have someone who gets the process, is invested in that sort of an exchange one on one, um, and, and is fluent in their, their home language. Um, what we did end up doing was um, translating. The kids ended up uh, writing in their home language, and then they, we translated it into English, which was a really powerful activity for them who, as they're trying to learn English. But I'd say probably the primary thing I'd say is, it, um, you might say it's about bodies, about having enough people to engage with young people one-on-one, um, -on -one, but it has to be folks who have some tools, including that language proficiency. Probably doesn't help you much, but um, but, I, but I guess I'd say now that isn't that what they need anyway? Thank you so much for coming. This was a wonderful audience, and uh, if you have questions for Christian, will be about for for a bit. And I know many of you, and I'm willing to share some references and those kinds of things if you want to follow up. Although if you Google Scholar Christian. Good number of those things are coming up as well. Thank you. Thank you.